Hello, and welcome to the Frank Farmer Loomis Show. I'm Frank Farmer Loomis, your host, and as you know, we're always talking about some of the great glories of Cincinnati. It's architecture, it's art, it's history. Once in a while, it's antiques. Well, today we have a very, very special guest, John Ventry. And he, John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mr. Loomis. <laughs> and you're going to tell us how Mount Ida became Mount Adams. I heard that story before. <laughs> You've heard it? And how all about the Cincinnati Observatory. A couple of weeks ago, I was lucky enough to sit in on your class for UC's Continuing Ed, right? Okay, that's correct. About um, the Cincinnati Observatory. We did a nice tour of the observatory that night. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And let, let's just start. What happened, uh, and then you take it away from me, in the 18, say like 1840s, and when you're listening to John, Think about that view of uh, Cincinnati at the public library in the lobby, that 1848 one. Oh, that horizontal one. Yeah, the, the horizontal yes, yep. one. And that's basically what Cincinnati looked like then. It was done by Porter. But Okay. And the city at that time had approximately maybe 110,000 people, give or take. So tell us what was going on then. Well, about uh, 1842, we'll start with there. Okay. Uh, there was a, um, a gentleman named Ormsby McKnight Mitchell. Uh, he was a West Point graduate. Uh, was reared up in Lebanon, Ohio. In fact, one of the rooms upstairs, the Golden Lamb, is named for him. Ah. If you ever get back up to the Golden Lamb, go upstairs, check out the Ormsby McKnight Mitchell room. Uh, eventually, he went to West Point, graduated from there, and uh, then he came back to the city. Uh, he was doing some surveying, surveyed our Miami Railroad, which is the Loveland Bike Trail, and then he started teaching downtown at the Cincinnati College teaching engineering, mathematics, surveying, and astronomy. All your subjects that you Yes, love. yes. Yeah. And about that time, there was also a group in town, I love this name, the Society for the Promotion of Useful Knowledge. And I think we need to resurrect that society again. We surely do. <laughs> yeah. Well, they offered to Mitchell the opportunity to lecture to the citizens. He started his lecture in his lecture hall, overflowed that. So then they moved the lecture to the Wesley Chapel which was on 5th Street, right where Procter & Gamble's garden is. It had a uh, chapel auditorium which seated 1,200 people. That's a lot. Back then, that was a lot. They filled that night after night with Mitchell talking about the glories of heaven. He was a very religious man, so he would always relate what he saw in the sky to the glory of God. No wonder he liked astronomy. That's right, yeah. And uh, uh, at the end of the lecture, they'd say, well, why then could we not, the citizens of Cincinnati, do something for the country that the then at that time previous John Quincy Adams presidency who tried to start the country's first national observatory failed. So they started a Cincinnati Astronomical Society. Private citizens are forming a public institution, very rare back then. The way they funded it we think is a first. Since Mitchell was selling stock for the railroads, he said let's sell shares for a membership in the society. <laughs> $25 to become a member. Big bucks then. In 1842, that was like two or three months salary for a laborer. That was a lot of money. But even more surprising to me is that within about three weeks, 300 people contributed the $25 or higher to farm the society. They then commissioned Mitchell to go to Europe to purchase a telescope. They did not make telescopes of significant size in America at that time. So then eventually he ended up in Munich, Bavaria, the house of Mers and Mahler, that's M-A-H-L-E-R. M-A, I'm good, yeah. Mers and Mahler. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, got the then second largest telescope in the world. The Tsar of Russia had the largest one. The Tsar of Russia, and um, you're gonna t tell us about that story about John Quincy Adams. When he was with the Tsar, yes, okay. Uh, earlier before John Quincy became president, his whole life was dedicated to the service of the country ever since he was a teenager. And he had traveled with his dad, John Adams. That's right. And he was appointed the first minister, today we would use the word ambassador, to, Alex to Russia, Alexander I, who had the world's largest telescope. He was an expert at astronomy and taught John Quincy astronomy. And Quincy then had a passion for astronomy the rest of his life. He was only one of the two presidents who had a keen interest in science, much less astronomy. Was Jefferson. Jefferson was the other one. Yeah. Oh, what a good guess You got I that. Did. All right. You get an A on that one. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so um, uh, 
then based on that knowledge, then he had a passion for astronomy, and every day he would record in his diary, his personal diary, not the one that got published, unfortunately, uh, what he saw in the sky, naked eye, or with a little handheld telescope. <laughs> so I'd love to read that story, uh, that diary. I've never been able to get my hands on the actual the true uh, diary, though. Did you read the, um, you probably read biographies of John Quincy Adams. Yes. It? Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. yeah, he was quite a guy, yeah. Yeah, quite a role model. We should teach more about him in school, I think. I think you're right, especially with the astronomy and everything. So, so John Quincy Adams was getting involved trying to have a national observatory. Yeah. And he failed. He failed because this is the time, this was um, 1825, when the state rightist movement was quite strong back then. They did not want to give monies or control to the federal government. This would have been a federal institution. Mm -hmm. So they rejected his idea. So yes, presidents do occasionally fail. Yeah, but he really did, he sort of didn't fail because you're talking about him right now. Well, another reason then. And when, he had something named after him too. Well, the president of the society at the time was Judge Jacob Burnett from Bernard Woods fame, number one citizen in town. In the he, hotel too, right? Yes. He and Ormsey McKnight Mitchell got him up with the idea of now let's inviting the former president John Quincy to town to lay the cornerstone of the observatory. Now, he was 76 years old at this time, not in good health. His family did not want him to come to town, but we have his acceptance letter. He says, I'm on my way. If I'm delayed, it's not my fault. <laughs> and it wasn't like hopping on a plane and getting here, was it? No. Uh, in 1840s, uh, the railroads were just getting started. So he took one of those newfangled devices, a railroad from, he was staying with his son at the time in Boston. From Boston, he took a railroad to Lake Erie, a steamship across Lake Erie to Cleveland, a canal packet, a boat, Cleveland to Columbus, stagecoach from Columbus to Cincinnati. The last leg of the trip, he stayed at the Golden Lamb restaurant. And that's why they have a room named for him upstairs. And so again, two, you're going to check out two rooms next time you get up there. And they have the Charles Dickens room where they did, and yeah. he didn't stay there. Chuck got mad because they didn't serve hooch, and he went elsewhere. Well, I thought he stayed there. No, oh, uh -oh. that's a whole kind. No, he. I'm going to have to go up there and erase his name. <laughs> oh no, no, no! They might get mad at me for that, but um, he 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 didn't stay. He didn't stay there because he got mad because they didn't serve hooch. Oh my goodness! So, but it just adds to the story okay. of everything. So, John. Quincy Adams, the son of Abigail and John. So he President. gets to Cincinnati. Okay, then the city then shut down for one day for the dedication of the uh, observatory. Uh, there was a parade over a mile long. I find that hard to believe back. <laughs> a mile long. A mile long parade in 1842. Can you imagine how the streets stunk afterwards? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the of the anyway. So they were marching over the street, uh, I believe it was 6th Street eastward to this hill where they were going to build the observatory, Mount Ida. Mount Ida. Do you remember the old Mount Ida downtown? No, I don't go back that far, John. Oh, okay. Mount Ida, everybody. <laughs> this is how Mount Ida, Mount Ida became Mount Adams. Adams. There was this hill, which now, of course, is Mount Adams, called Ida. And according to legend, underline that, uh, there was a woman named Ida. She lived on the hill. She used to do the wash for the soldiers in Fort Washington down along 2nd, 3rd, 4th Street. Oh. And according to legend, she lived in the trunk of a huge old sycamore tree. Ah. And we have a sketch of that period, so therefore it has to be true. It was in print. It has to be true. <laughs> so uh, they, they climbed up this hill. Uh, horrible rainy day that day, so he gave a very, very short talk. He had a two-hour lecture prepared. But the next day, he repeated his lecture in the Wesley Chapel with seated 1,200 people. This day, 3,000 squeezed in to hear him talk. And at the end of the lecture, the city essentially said, thank you, sir, for coming to town. In your honor, we're gonna rename the hill from the hill from Mount Ida to Mount Adams. And the rest is, as they say, history. history. That's a, so the observatory opens up, Mount Ida becomes Mount, Mount Adams. Adams, okay. And then the city, according to legend, is built on seven hills based on the Rome story. And two of those hills got the name because of the observatory, where they eventually moved it out to Mount Lookout in the 1870s. So we are very hill-oriented. <laughs> we are very, well, it's, it's just an incredibly beautiful city, and that's why we like to do this show to highlight it. So it opened up, and then how long did the, the observatory stay in the newly coined Mount Adams? Well, the telescope 
was under construction from 42 to 45. It was shipped across the Atlantic down to New Orleans, up the Mississippi River, up oh. the Ohio River. Landed here 18, spring 1845. It saw its first starlight, spring 1845. So then Mitchell then operated the observatory from that time forward until eventually he died in the Civil War. Mm. But unfortunately, <clears throat> the uh, city was doubling in size about every 10 years, become industrialized. This is what I love, you point this and out. And they started yeah. burning soft coal instead of wood to heat and fuel itself. And the byproduct of that soft coal was thick, yuck, sooty, yucky smoke. It really put the damper on the astronomy on top of the hill. You also had 30 and 40 paddle wheel boats lined up along the High River right under the foot of Mount Adams, belching smoke out of the smokestack. That contributed to the problem. So the best laid plans failed because of the smoke pollution. They could not do astronomy on top of the hill. So then he was called up to New York to found another observatory. He then did successfully come back to Cincinnati. They had a problem with the director up there. They fired the director. They persuaded Mitchell then to go up to New York to do his astronomy work. So he was director of two observatories at the same time. This was in the early 1860s. Well, Civil War broke out. Since he was a West Point graduate and a very patriotic man, he volunteered his services to the country. His friends went to President Lincoln. Lincoln made him a general. And his first assignment was to come back to the city of Cincinnati to help defend the city from the planned southern troops coming up through neutral Kentucky. And people were very afraid of that then, weren't they? They had reason to because Cincinnati was supplying materiel to the northern troops down in, in the south. Cincinnati was very pivotal in the Civil War. You, you know, I've learned, you're right, it, because they did all the business with the southerners, didn't they? Yeah, and we were porkopolis because we were supplying the meat to the soldiers in the south. So we had, those were, and they were worried about John Hunt Morgan. Poor guy, around. yeah. So our, our hero, Mr. Corporal, was he, or general? Well, uh, at this time, uh, he was um, appointed a general. He was, general? He was a captain when he came to Cincinnati. And the poor guy died during the Civil War. Then he died during the Civil War of yellow fever down in uh, South Carolina. And then what happened to the observatory? Well, the observatory, the Cincinnati Observatory then was without a director. So the board of directors, Alfonso Teoff was now president. Board members were Shilato. Uh, We've heard Pro that name before. Shilato. John Shilato. John Probasco. Probasco. Uh, Fountain Square fame and those characters. And uh, uh, they decided to bring in another director. And they brought in Cleveland Abbey, A-B-B-E, or Abbe, some pronounce it. Some of the older Cincinnatians might remember the old Abbey Observatory in town, which was out on the Lafayette Circle. Ah. We'll, we'll get to that later on, though. Okay. So uh, They need a new location? So he came to town as an astronomer, well-qualified astronomer. Uh, but he had the same problem as Mitchell, the smoke pollution. So rather than sit on the hill just twiddling his thumbs, he had another interest, and that was in meteorology. What's that? Weather. Oh, weather. 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 Which was a... Really high-tech thing, yes. wasn't it? Uh, well, back then, it wasn't developed. Mm. And uh, then, by this time, the country had stretched telegraph lines out as far as Denver, and Abbey then communicated telegraphically to all the major cities in the country, including the western cities, asking essentially, what is your weather? And from the telegraph reply, he noticed there was a pattern what the weather was in one area west turned out to be the area east the next day. So Cleveland Abbey, while working as a director of the observatory, was the first American weather predictor. So Just I, another incredible thing that's yeah. happened here in Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Excuse me for interrupting yeah. you, but. So we're on TV today, and always the TV weathermen give you the weather. It all started at Cincinnati, Cincinnati Observatory, Cleveland Abbey. So now we have the weather forecast. Yes, sir. And we have yeah. the pollution. Yeah. Mount I Ida is Mount Adams. Adams. And then they make a big Well, decision. something happened to Abbey. Oh. Uh, President Grant heard what he was doing, oh. and he liked the idea. So he yanked him up to Washington, D.C., reported to the Department of the Army this was going to be a secret war tool to be able to predict weather. No wars were going on at the time. Thank God, yeah. Yeah, after the Civil War. So while he was still director of the observatory, he started the process of finding the National Weather Service. That's another claim to fame for the old observatory. Well, by this time then, the, um, 
board of directors realized they had a problem and they had to close the observatory. And also at the same time, the board of directors of the observatory and their colleagues in Cincinnati realized that a city of our size should have a university. So they decided to start the then new University of Cincinnati. So the board of directors of the observatory closed the observatory, donated the assets to the city of Cincinnati with a provision to be given to the then new University of Cincinnati and a new observatory be built. Well, John Kilgore, he was on both boards, I believe, uh, the observatory in UC, uh, donated $10,000 to build our current building. Which, which huge cost, amount of money. Which cost $30,000 total, just a hair under $30,000. He donated the flat four acres upon which the observatory sits in Mount Lookout. And then years later, his son, uh, Bayard, donated 10 additional acres. So the, it was 14 acres on campus at the observatory. So when UC started, there were three departments, art, academics, and observatory. Now, tell us where the new location is. To, like, pretend like I, I don't know anything about Cincinnati. Okay, it's well, hard uh, to find it, maybe. It but. is hard to find. Uh, think of the area of Mount Lookout Hyde Park. Okay. Observatory Avenue, and most people are acquainted with that street. And it dead ends on the east route at Alt Park. At Alt Park. Yeah. Now, as you're going down Observatory Avenue, uh, right before you get to Alt Park, there's a little small street called Observatory Place. How appropriate. Which is left or north of Observatory Avenue as you're going towards Alt Park. And as soon as you turn on that little side street, Alt or um, Observatory Place, uh, you'll see the observatory at the end of the street. There's only about five or six houses on the street, I believe. Yeah. And what a knockout building. It is a park-like setting. And the building is a gorgeous building uh, designed by Samuel Hannaford. And what, which is really interesting because we've had a guest on talking about a music hall, which they, the style is sort of called um, Sauerbraten <laughs> Gothic. <laughs> and then, of course, City Hall, which is, you know, what, sort of Richardson S after Richardson. With famous arches and all, yeah. But the Cincinnati Observatory to me is just pure neoclassical. It's just beautiful. It reminds me of Chiswick House. In well, London, London, outside of London. Does it you? Uh, yes. I, I, I uh, definitely can draw an analogy to that. Uh, but and we're always amazed at the number of people uh, as they're just cruising around town. They get up that neighborhood. Uh, they come back on that little side street, and they just circle around. We have a circle driveway. Right. And they go really, really slow. They pause. They stop. They look. And a few of them will actually come in. We, we would Good. Like, we always like them to come in. Come in next yeah. time you're on observatory yeah. place, but, everybody. Uh, it, it is a place that Cincinnatians just love to drive by. It's amazing. I'd like to get 25 cents for every car that goes by there, though. Yeah, because 25 cents, that's what you were saying on the tour that the boys would get working at night, helping uh, that, out with That was them. a salary for the teenager working at the observatory. But the dome, everybody, for, for um, the new observatory, um, just looks like a dome that neoclassical architects would have uh, based on the Pantheon and Rome and everything. It's just, well, the columns, are, it's a beautiful, beautiful building. Well, when the building was built in the 1870s, 73, it did not have the metal dome. It uh, had a cupola. A cupola. Which is a cylinder, a truncated cylinder, and they had a slit across the top of the roof and vertical slit down one of the side, and that circular cupola would rotate 360 degrees so the telescope inside could point out and view the things in the sky. And it used to rotate on big old ball bearings. And what they used for ball bearings were Civil War cannonballs, 32 pound cannonballs. And the story is the cannonballs oh. tended to cluster on one side, it wouldn't rotate very well. So they replaced that whole wooden cupola with the sheet metal dome in 1892. Perfection. She, yeah, and yeah. I'm glad to see good use came to those cannonballs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, I don't know if you've ever been there, but one of these gorgeous houses you tour, and in the corner of this beautiful dining room that's like 1840, 1850, there's a cannonball in the corner that's encased in a, a glass case or something. On a pistol. Yeah. Have you seen that? And no, it landed I can picture it. there when the family oh, was dining goodness. during the Civil War. When the what a great story! Yeah, but so well, I like your better story because uh -huh. I didn't do any damage. Uh -huh. So what happened to the old telescope from the? Did they keep that from well, Mount the, Adams? The, the telescope then was moved into the new building. Into the new building. But now you have an empty, vacant 
building on top of Mount Adams. Uh -huh. Now let's just back up just a little bit. In 1842, when Mitchell was going around door to door trying to get $25 from all the citizens, he knocked on the door of Nicholas Longworth. Oh, this is a good story, everybody. Yeah. Now, Nicholas Longworth was the second wealthiest man in the country with his real estate holdings. And he liked the idea of what Mitchell was planning on doing. And he said, well, rather than give you the $25, I will donate four acres on top of Mount Ida. He was growing grapes uh, in his uh, grape arbors on top of the hill. And that's where the initial four acres uh, occurred from. Well, he stipulated in his bequest that if the land ever were sold, the proceeds from the sale would go to him or his heirs. That's how he became the second richest man in Ohio. That's right. Yeah. Smart man. So when it was sold to the passionate fathers who built a monastery literally on top of the observatory building, they took off the dome or the, the rolling roof. It was another form of cupola. Uh, added a third floor, put a belfry on the top, and built a wooden church. And that was the Holy Cross Monastery on top of Mount Adams. And the proceeds from that sale, uh, when they purchased that from the Astronomical Society, went to fund the art department at University of Cincinnati. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. So of the three departments, the founding of UC, two-thirds was founded or funded by the observatory. The observatory component by itself, and then the sale of the um, uh, old site on Mount Adams, the proceeds from that went to fund the art department for UC. Which led to the Cincinnati Art Museum. That is right. Now, most people think it went to the DAA or DAAP, mm -hmm. but no, they, they broke off before DAA came along. And because Nicholas Longworth was just an incredible. Yeah. And so, and that, and we were. Let's talk about him. <laughs> we, 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 could whole, like, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. we could do a whole series okay. on him. No, but Grandpa, I always call him Grandpa, Grandpa. Nick. He's the, hey, but why, do you, why do you call him Grandpa? That's because he was Mariah Longworth Nichols' grandfather, the okay. founder of Rookwood. Okay, so that's, and he right, helped, well, that's grandfather. I thought it was your grandfather. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. uh, so I always call him Grandpa Nick. Sometimes my friends at the TAF think maybe I'm being disrespectful, <laughs> but uh, Grandpa Nick was quite a guy, and Cincinnati was the second city uh, in the U.S. of A. to have a, a designated art museum in the late 1800s in Eden Park. So you're hesitating? Uh, you know? Yeah, I, I, I do a blank on that uh, statistic. So uh, the second city? Yeah, I think okay. so, after okay. New York City, I, I beat Chicago. Okay. So, okay, so then the land, is, uh, so then we're, we built the new Samuel Hannaford Observatory. Uh, on observatory. Mount Lookout, And of High course, Park. back then, there was nothing there. Nothing. And tell, oh, I love this on your tour. Tell us about why there are no trees there today. That was Well, we have a photograph of the old observatory on sitting on top of the hill right after it was built. And there were no trees. And the reason we were told is that all the trees within many miles of Cincinnati were cut down to provide wood, fuel to heat and power the cities and the factories. That's before they started burning the coal. I think that's a great point to make yeah. because uh, lots of times, you know, that they weren't reforested. And then in those days, there weren't many houses around there then. Well, the Kilgore brothers, John uh -huh. and Charles, mm -hmm. uh, purchased that land. Mm -hmm. And then they wanted to uh, uh, develop the land for uh, real estate, for their real estate, they were prospectors. And they, I think they probably, another reason they brought the observatory out there to get more people out there. Mm -hmm. John, we're, we're, I don't want to give away all your secrets okay, for okay. when you're teaching your UC okay. class, but, um, uh, but I would like to ask you, so what the old telescope, I love this because the old telescope is like 1842. 42. Okay, we call it 45 because it saw, 45. Its, it saw its first starlight in 45. That makes great okay, sense. Okay. So it was born in 1845 when yeah, I saw it. Right. That's considered the old telescope. That's the old telescope. And it's still in use. Daily, in the building nightly next use, door yes. of yours. And, and didn't you say in the whole world it might be the most conti it, oldest? Oldest continue to use uh, what we call professional or public telescope in the world. Okay. We've not found an older one yet. Not an older one. Okay, yeah. so then you get another one, a new, the new one. The new one came which along is in 19, <laughs> yeah, 1904 is our new telescope. Oh, I love it because it, everything's subjective. Yeah, one's, yeah. one person's antique is somebody's new thing. Yeah. So you got the new one in 19... 1904. 1904. And in 1904, they did not have electricity at the observatory. So this huge instrument had to operate on mechanical power. Oh. You have to crank up a 400-pound weight, and the weight falls in response to gravity to make the telescope function. Is that when you were telling me the young teenage boys would work there 25 cents a night? Yes, and they had various jobs in the observatory in a darkened room. Of course, one of them was to keep the weight cranked up, because once the weight hits the bottom, everything stops. So 
so you can see all that now. And tell us, the building is in such absolutely beautiful condition. Was, was it, um, it's always been beautifully maintained, but has it been restored or updated? Um, well, you, you, see, you see owned and operated mm -hmm. from the 1870s until current times. In fact, they still own the facility. Okay. Uh, but they wanted to get out of the observatory business for whatever reason. It didn't fit their, their long range plan. And they were not maintaining the building adequately and over the years it degraded. So by the 1990s, uh, it was deplorable condition. Everything was leaking, uh, the domes, yeah. windows, the walls, the foundation. And the strong rumor was they were going to come out and bulldoze both of the buildings, sell the 14 acres at a million dollars an acre and put up high rise condominiums. In the 90s? In the mid 1990s, yeah. So that's when a group of us got together. Good for you. Thank you, thank you. The, the group did. And uh, we formed a 501c3 not-for-profit Cincinnati Observatory Center negotiated with UC for a year and a half. They turned it over to us. We had a designated a National Historic Landmark, yeah. and we had to raise somewhere between two and two and a half million dollars to restore the landmark to meet National Landmark standards. But in this phase, UC stepped up, and they were extremely helpful in raising the funds and providing the funds, and uh, they now, uh, have one seat on our board. Did they give you that handsome shirt there? I'm a little <laughs> jealous of that. Cincinnati <laughs> Observatory. There's the dome. That's a, be no, that's a beautiful logo uh, there. Uh, maybe it? turn a little bit more to the camera in case you can see it. <laughs> yeah. That's, now, um, I don't want to give away all your secrets because... Uh, we want people to come down and take the tour. Take the tour. So we're going to hold you guessing everybody about all this. But I want to know how do we... Uh, how do we sign up for your classes or do the tours uh, and do the tours at Cincinnati? Can you give us a web address? Or? Well, uh, there's two ways to do it. Uh, the way you took it was the University of Cincinnati Come University. Yay, Come uh, University. We, we give approximately every quarter, uh, we give a class through them. Of the, We call it Behind the Scenes at the Observatory. It's a two-hour tour. Mm -hmm. And also on the second and fourth Sunday of the month, one to four in the afternoon, we give history tours, so they just walk in. When you walk in, we have some docents and tour guides. We just start the tour. You, you and, are a docent extraordinaire. Yeah, and, and one of the things that is, uh, I urge you to go to take your class, or um, and the class is through Come University. Come University. You have to go Google. through Come University, University to sign University up for it. For that one, um, is that you show all the in and outs about the scientific aspects of the whole thing. And we actually, I actually got to look at the moon that night in the 1845 right. telescope. The oldest telescope. We, we always try to schedule that class when a first quarter phase moon is going to be in the sky. And if weather permits, at the end of the class, everybody gets to look in the oldest telescope in the world at the moon. It has been a pleasure to talk to you today, John Ventre, of well, the thank you for Cincinnati the Observatory. Thanks for the invitation to provide My the pleasure. information. And look, everybody, he does this all off the top of his head, doesn't have to have notes like me and everything. <laughs> just another example, weather forecasting here, the great observatory, just another thing why Cincinnati is called the Queen City. Th I want to thank Beverly Schneider, Nikki Bishop, and all at ACT-TV here. And stay tuned for another Frank Farmer Loomis show.